when we do one of these screening tests and we get back less than favorable numbers. You, you did say we'll dive deeper into some things, but I right. might be scared. Like, I don't want to develop something. So that may even prevent me from going and getting a test. I'm glad you touched on that. And that's a huge issue that I face in practice of medicine, especially in Jamaica, because some Jamaicans feel like, say, well, from it, from it not kill me, I'd rather not know about it. Well, it could kill you though. But um, they do prefer to avoid seeking further information, which mm. is odd for me because I'm health seeking. So I don't really even relate to that. Right. I want to know and I want to fix it. So if you're scared, I cannot actually spend my time impressing upon them the long-term effects of the illness. So, you know, hypertension can lead to end organ damage, kidney failure, right. heart attacks, stroke. And diabetes and hypertension, I like to say that they're best friends. They like to hang out. So once you get one, sometimes the other one sometimes appears. And when the two are together, it's like they're both damaging blood vessels on the inside. And mm -hmm. So if I kind of impress upon them that you don't want to have a heart attack down the line, you don't want to have a stroke down the line, because these things will worsen the quality of life. You just don't yeah. want to. No, it's it's so true, yeah. but it's so hard to talk to like a 20 year old or a 30 year old saying when you are 65, <laughs> the when things I... you do now are going to affect you then and you don't want that then. So don't do that now. It's it's a very hard conversation to have. Well, it was not even 65 anymore. You know what I mean? My dad, my dad had a heart attack. He's alive. He had his first heart attack, sub 50. That's a risk factor for me. So his heart attack was like about 49. Mm. And um, that's a risk factor. Parents with heart attack less than 50 right. <laughs> or 55. And, and I fell into that category. So when I checked my cholesterol as a young person, it was high. And all of my family members at some point had high cholesterol. Like, and they're not smokers. They're not obese. So it seems like there's a genetic predisposition, predisposition to high cholesterol in my family line that we only picked up because of this heart attack. Right, right, right. But since then, I've been exercising, trying to eat properly, and I'm on statins. I take medication for high cholesterol for, for, for years. I've been on them for a long time. Wow. So wow. that's just proof to show you that we can find something, mm -hmm. we can monitor something, we can intervene, and the protection may give us yeah. a better quality of life down the line. Absolutely. And the earlier that you catch things, the more of an impact diet and lifestyle changes will have because Absolutely. there are with all of these lifestyle oriented diseases, um, diet and lifestyle play a massive role. Actually, there's a whole study out, um, a new field of study that's emerging called epigenetics, right? And epigenetics tells us that how you live your life actually has a really strong um it's even stronger than a genetic predisposition in terms of expression of disease. So just because you have the risk factors, if you live your life a certain way, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, supplements. But Natalie, aren't you a practitioner like of, of this? Yeah, so we do. I do. I do a test. Um, I do an epigenetic test with clients, but it's it's so massive and it's so powerful. It's so empowering, you know. Right. And that's really what I want to get across to people: not to be afraid of the test. But well, how does the epigenetic test guide you thereafter? So after you get the information, what kind of information are you gathering? I'll, I'll know so many factors, um, vitamins, minerals, um, antioxidants, fatty acids, how you're metabolizing your proteins, um, how sensitive you are to things like radiation, um, even like electronic devices, cell phones and stuff. And then we, we can make dietary shifts. So if you are somebody that has to get an x-ray, for example, I would strongly recommend that you take spirulina or chlorella, which are some of them blue green yes, yeah, and the good oh, ones, spirulina. Oh, <laughs> spirulina. Yeah. <laughs> because those help to detoxify the body of things like radiation, things like heavy metals. So if you do have to get like an x-ray of your mouth, if you go to the dentist, Take some spirulina for a few weeks after to start you know the team. This is where I'm going to interview you because I do want to tell the viewers that because I was trained in traditional medicine, I don't actually focus in this space. <laughs> and, um, a lot of Jamaicans do like naturopathy. They like natural stuff. And I think this is a good place to say that I support the fusion of it all because yes. it cannot hurt. So I think coming to a GP like myself, 
to do all of the medical, traditional medical stuff is great. But I think it's great if they come to someone like you to get advice on all the vitamins and the mineral, the, you know, the minerals and yeah. spirulina. Yeah, and it's really nice. Yeah, it, it, it's, say, huh? it's so true though. You no, it's, 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 yeah. That wasn't singing that you wanted, I don't know. What is chronic? Like, is, that, is this the song happening? <laughs> that's what you that's what chronic said. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you're touching on vitamins and minerals. And interestingly enough, I actually have people coming into the store with a prescription written by a doctor with the amount of milligrams of things like calcium and vitamin D and this, that, and the other that they want them to take. So you encourage me to definitely. I love, <laughs> I love the fact that um, allopathic traditional practitioners are recognizing the impact of vitamins and minerals and supplements and herbs on the body. It's, I, th I think it's great. There's a bunch of reasons why we need to supplement now more than ever. Um, farming practices have made food less nutritious. Honestly, you, most people don't eat the way they should be eating, right? Absolutely. So they're, they're going for the fast food, things that are causing inflammation, um, stress, alcohol, and uh, overuse of, um, Prescription medication has destroyed the gut microbiome, so our digestive system doesn't work as well. You know, stress makes us not digest our food as well, and when we can't digest our food well, we're not absorbing those nutrients. Okay. Age, nobody yeah. likes to hear this, but the older you get, the less things work. You're not digesting your food, so we do. Yeah, yeah. hence the screening guidelines. Forty, forty, fifty. That's where it's going. Hence the screening guidelines and the need for a good multivitamin. <laughs> but it's not all downhill, you know, from 40, just 18. People know that, not that I would know, but. Oh, like, whatever. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, I came alive at 40, like in yeah. like amazing ways. So I yeah. really stepped into my skin. So don't be afraid of getting older, folks. Don't be afraid. The mind is one of the things. I naturally tell you what I'm going to do. Let's throw some numbers at the people. Okay, all okay. Right. So we're talking about know your numbers. So let's yes. start body mass index. It mm. is a ratio of weight in kilograms over height in meter squared. And when you do that, you get this, these numbers. And normal is 18 to 25. 26 to 30 is overweight. Yellow zone. 31 to 40 is obese. Red zone. There is pretty much 41. It goes up, morbidly obese. It just yes. goes up, very obese, right? So this is based on your height and it is a good marker for what weight you should be. So people, the, common, the most common thing I hear from people is, Lord God, if I lose the weight, I'm gonna look crazy. And I know these are not people who work out a lot because their perception of weight loss is that they're gonna look gaunt right. and skinny, but they don't recognize a lot of bodybuilders are lean muscle yes. and they're low body fat and they weigh like 160 pounds, like for a man, for like a five nine, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> my BMI is probably somewhere between, I'm in the overweight zone. I'm in that zone. And I might be like a 27. Maybe, I don't remember. I have to check. But I'm 5'9 and a little bit, and I weigh 172 pounds. I don't look crazy, but I'm trying to get to 165. Like a nice, lean, mm -hmm. muscle, mm -hmm. cardio, 60, 165. Yeah, that's where I want to be. And I'll be healthy. And BMI for men, is, that, is it different from BMI for women? BMI is standard for adults, but okay. I know what you're asking me, and it's the great, it's the one place where BMI can be inaccurate. And let's give an example. Same 5'9 man, that's me, but I am 200 pounds of lean muscle because I work out. It's going to make me look overweight. Right. But it's actually muscle. So it's healthy tissue. And that's where the BMI is inaccurate. So if you have someone who's very muscular, mm -hmm. it will make them their BMI come out of the normal range. And it and it doesn't mean that they are actually at greater risk of, of disease. Yeah, because most people that. look at me and can't guess my weight. <laughs> it's a lot of muscle. Oh, we're not talking about this, right? <laughs> no, we're not, we're not going any further than just that. <laughs> ask me my right. age any day. Don't ask me my weight. <laughs> I'm all right. But we know you work out. And you work out 
group very very regularly and you yeah. do a mixture of cardio and and weightlifting which cardio is cardio and weights and flexibility that's the that's the that's the triad that i believe in so yeah. stretching flexibility cardio and and strength training that's totally it. agreed that's the way to the best way to keep off weight too guys so don't just do cardio uh, wow this went everywhere this is like what to do in exercise I know. Um, <laughs> this is going high, everywhere. Blood, high blood pressure american heart association now yes. they are using 130 over 80 and they lowered it it used to be 140 over 90 so this means once you have a blood pressure of 130 over 80 you're technically hypertensive wow but in the uk i believe they're still using 140 over 90 a lot of insurance companies still use 140 over 90. And most times medication is not initiated until 140 over 90. But it's a case by case basis, depending on what illnesses you have and mm -hmm, other stuff. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. What lowering it has done, though, means that your chance of being hypertensive is a little greater because right, <laughs> a lot right, of people right. are probably hovering in that 130. So but there already. must be a reason why they lowered it because, like, well, hypertension is screening for circulatory cardiac type situation so it must be that they started to see these issues cropping up in people with a blood pressure that's lower than what they were screening for absolutely you knocked it there's no more to it than that so yeah and again i think it's because of all the lifestyle changes that we've made in the bad way <laughs> over yep the yep so again diet and lifestyle hypertension exercising eating foods that are low in inflammatory oils that are low in sodium and taking some herbs that help to support a healthy blood pressure are good things that you can do there. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. very linked to, to salt intake, sodium chloride intake on the dietary side for blood pressure. So yeah. you hear some people say what is sugar and pressure. Um, salt is more contributory to the blood pressure than sugar is. Right. So yes, and um, exercise also is beneficial as well. Exercise has helped with everything. And sleep, people people discount sleep. the importance of sleep. sleep. All of these things. People get, Natalie, you tell me what you were taught. Back in the Seven day, you to eight hours a night if you're over 25. Sleep, right. Um, How much exercise does somebody get? Oh, sorry. No, it used to be three days a week. They used to say, work out half an hour for three days a week. But no, that's not what they're saying. Now they're saying, have actually moderate to high activity almost daily. So the studies put out um, are showing that moderate moderate exercise is like five to seven days. Yeah, yeah, it's immuno enhancing even. So you're gonna ha um, have a healthier immune system. Moderate 30, 30 minutes a day every day. Because be guess what? Off. We are sitting down in front of our computers way yeah. too much and not moving around. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So even just something like getting a step tracker and and trying to beat your yesterday. Yeah, it's hard to get to 10,000 steps. I make it some days, but it's not easy. It's really hard to get to 10,000 steps. I think I made it when I was at Disney World. I, don't, I never do that much walking. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're doing a cardio class or walking, walking, you can't get there. If yeah. You're, yeah. Walk the supermarket, easy. park far away, that kind of stuff. Oh, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself. World Diabetes Month, let's get to one. We're going to Diabetes do month, yeah. Diabetes month. Um, random blood blood glucose. What that is, is if you walked into a doctor's office and they did that like a finger prick test. Mm -hmm. come back. If your blood sugar is higher than 11.1 .1 millimoles, then that suggests that you may have diabetes. Hmm. That's a random. So that's doing right. it anytime. But we have other markers to screen. So we have a fasting blood sugar, which you look at too. So if right. you fasted from the night before, meaning you didn't eat any food from like, 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. and you woke up in the morning and went to a lab and did a blood test like 7 a.m. It should be, normal should be less than 5.6 millimoles per liter, right? So this is what kind of numbers we are, single digit. Yeah. If you're between 5.6 and 6.9, that's considered pre-diabetes. That's your warning and bell. That's your warning bell. We don't normally treat that. And that's a great screening warning bell in a way because it means that you can really curtail your sugar intake because maybe your body's not breaking it down as well. Yeah. And you know what, Mario, we need, when we say sugar, people say, but I don't really eat sugar. Peanut butter has sugar. Ketchup has sugar. Like there's sugar in so many, bread has sugar. Like you may not eat crystal granules of sugar. You right. may not put that in your tea, but you are getting it in your diet. Getting it in your diet. And remember guys, that complex carbs are also sugars. Well, carbohydrates in the yeah. same family. They're yeah. just broken down slower. So yam, sweet potato, these are carbs. So we even have to be careful with those, but they are a little safer because they don't 
break down as quickly as the cane yep. sugar. Yep, yep, yep. Now we're getting into the glycemic index. <laughs> right, all right. And the last one for the fasting blood sugar, greater than seven on two separate tests is diagnostic of diabetes. Diabetes. So, again, we're type still in two. type two diabetes, right, which tends to happen in adulthood and, right. and later in life. Yeah, versus type one. Yeah, so again, not a death sentence, things you oh. need to know and not be afraid of, right? Because when oh, you know, right. it's a spectrum, right? So I've heard you talk about 5.6, 5.6, getting closer to, da, 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 da. So along that spectrum, you can you can slow the progression, you can halt right. the progression, you can reverse that progression. Right. You can change your fasting blood sugar. So diet and lifestyle, we keep coming back to it. So know your numbers, don't be afraid to get tested and adjust diet and lifestyle. Eat like a healthy person. Yeah. As opposed I mean. to... I know. No, Natalie will tell you what that means. <laughs> I want to also tell patients to challenge their doctors. And, and I mean this respectfully to the people in my fraternity. Um, I had a client come to me recently who basically said, I wanted to get another opinion because I wanted someone to give me better guides. So once he said that, which is something I normally do anyway, I weigh him every time he comes. And... I, I didn't just weigh him on and just document the figures. I tell him, this is your appropriate weight for height. This would be a good weight for you to try to get to. As someone who works out, I know losing one to two pounds a week with good diet and proper exercise is not abnormal. Right. And using that as a guide, you could lose four to eight pounds in a month. Right. So you also don't give him an unrealistic or her an unrealistic guideline to meet because, you know, if a person ever lose 80 pounds, you have to tell them, say, look here, just take it take It's it going to take a little time. Take a little time. But, you know, when you tell somebody 80 pounds on, a, on the go, they get, they get nervous. So, yeah. yeah. So, I want, I want us to challenge your physicians. Ask them to tell you your numbers. Ask them to ensure that you understand what the numbers mean and what they are and where you need to be. You can, if you don't know where you need to be, then, what, then how are you monitoring? Yeah. And you have absolutely. to monitor as well. Absolutely. And I, I love to recommend to people to keep, Keep, keep copies of their tests. So ask your doctor for your copy and keep, keep a file test. because you keep may them. change doctors. Right. And you want to have your history because the, the trend over time is important. Have you always had high cholesterol or did it just show up? I don't know if the doctor is a new doctor. They're not going to have your history. So and, it's and important. They want it. Say well, I want it. I say, and they want it. Well, I want it. Yeah. Yeah, I keep all of my records from way back when. <laughs> I do as well love everything. And I do meet people who trust their doctors so much that they don't keep their own tests, but keep them. And now, yeah. now in a digital age, you can probably keep them a digital copy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and then um, you, you recommend um, seeing your doctor at least once a year just to go through some screening tests. Is that a good idea? Absolutely. If you're, if you're in good health and you don't have other risk factors, then I think annually is reasonable. And um, right now, the new pap smear guidelines are actually, most of them are every three years that you can do a pap smear. Oh. But it's on the basis though that you've had normal tests. So let's say you had a normal one this year and a normal one next year, then at least you would have a trend and a pattern right. which right. demonstrated that you have two normal tests. Um, and cervical cancer actually takes about 10 years to go from no cancer to cancer. So when you look at the lifespan of cervical oh, cancer. Oh, that's, such, that's such a good, that's such a good thing to know. So, so now the guidelines are going with like three years for PAP and even shorter for this other HPV test that they do more commonly in the US than we do here. So what is that test? HPV? It's HPV, HPV testing. You can do HPV testing. And um, I'm not a gynecologist and this is where I'm going to pull the phone. But um, <laughs> a little bit um, more sensitive. So you may be able to do HPV testing and test in a wider age gap. Wider human age gap, sorry, wider year gap. For example, let's see, age 30 to 65, you're saying a pap test every three years and an HPV test every five years, right? And they even have an HPV pap co-test. So it's like the two of them together. And you can do an HPV pap co-test every five years. This is a recommendation for the American Cancer Society. And this is in women aged 30 to 65. This is a 2018 guideline. So clearly it picks it up in a way where it's, if you get a negative test, you don't have to repeat it so frequently. It's right, 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 right. And also based on the timeline of the disease. That's nice to know. 
Nice to know. <laughs> but women do it annually because they tend to see the gynecologist annually to check yeah. on their lady part. So why not leave up to your waist in your gynecologist? So absolutely. Yeah. I'm doing it annually if if that's what you do. That's fine. That's good to know. That's good to know. I actually thought you were supposed to do it annually. So, so every that's what we've years. always been taught, actually. That's what we happy been taught. to know it's just every three years. <laughs> Yeah, so we've covered so many numbers, so many numbers. We've oh, talked about weight and height, to be weight, height, sugar, um, blood pressure. Blood pressure. Um, spoke about not even all the screening tests, but we touched a few. Yeah. There's so many more. So, but this is why people need to go to the doctor. Yes, I think I think that's the real big takeaway that people need to go to the doctor. People need to go to their doctor. Mario is awesome. We uh -huh. are going to put his information down below as to how you can book an appointment to see him because I think he's great. He's very, you're very comfortable when you're talking with him, you know? I, I try to be very candid and honest. Thanks, and if you thanks. don't want to come to me, we recommend other people. Even I will recommend other people. <laughs> so if you prefer to go to a female, and these are also things that people, people have preferences, like you would have a preference for a therapist. Like you may yes. want a male, you may want a female. People are out there. Lots of great doctors are here, so. Yeah, I think I think it's really important that people feel comfortable that they can develop that rapport with their doctor. Um, so whether it's you or someone else, get your screening tests done. It's Diabetes Awareness Month. You know, this disease is like super close and personal to me. So check the numbers and make the changes because it's better to stay healthy as long as possible, right? That should be a t-shirt. Yeah, check the numbers, make the changes. Check the numbers, make the changes. Natalie Moore is the live star. What, what more is there to say? What more is there to say? Mario, thank you so very much for sharing your time with thank you us. It was a pleasure, as always. How do people find you? Well, as a doctor, they can find me at DR Mario Guthrie on Instagram. Um, as Mario Evan, if you don't care about the medicine, I'm fine with that too. The personality is at Mario Evan, M E R I O E V O N, and it's total fun over there. And on the doctor's side, it's pretty boring. But <laughs> whatever you want, you find it. You follow. Thank you. You, you like, you subscribe, you share. It. <laughs> like, share, subscribe. <laughs> Absolutely. And check out the podcast. Mario, it's been a pleasure, as always. I love chatting with you. Likewise. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Conversations in Wellness. Let us know in the comments what you've thought about this and what kind of conversations you want to hear next. Till we meet again, peace and love. Bye. Bye.